Hello and welcome to the PhD Life Raft podcast. I'm Emma Brzezinski and today I am talking to Elisa Webb. Elisa is a current PhD student and we talk today about her experiences of being a mature student, having caring responsibilities having already moving out of an established career to enter into study and all the problems but also possibilities of that experience. So we touch on the luxury of studying. We also think about the challenges of managing and juggling lots of balls and we also talk about how hot water bottles can be a useful tool. So I hope you enjoy the episode. Hello, Elisa. Hi, hi. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you so much for being here. It is very lovely to have you here. You um, reached out by email and and had been listening to the podcast and said that you would be happy to share your experiences. And um, I'm so delighted that you did because I, I know we have got a gorgeous conversation coming up from what we've already been talking about. Um, So we always start with the kind of journey into the PhD. So tell us a little bit about how you have arrived where you are now. Well, I suppose it comes down to I didn't want to feel that my future was in my past. Um, I've been a head of department at Pop London School, I'd set it up, I created it, it was very successful. But I'd been a teacher for over 20 years and I needed a change before I got stale. Also, Mm -hmm. I'd had a very bad burnout and I'd become spectacularly unwell. So I'd got to this crisis or crossroads. And I suppose, long story short, I thought, why not go back to university and update myself? I've been sending students off to university for about 14 years. I didn't want to do more in education because I was sick of that piece of the jargon. Um, (laughs) Creative, yeah, creative writing was was a, a new hobby. And I thought, why not turn it into a qualification and maybe a career? Um, the other thing I was doing was I was trying to, by doing an MA, I was trying to fudge with future employers that I'd been too crazy to work. Anyway, so I <laughs> went to um, Roehampton to do my MA because it was somewhere I could get to on the bus. And it was like a very cool American high school. Most of the students on my course were American and it was amazing. I did well, uh, and I intuitively decided the PhD was my next move, a way of finishing off my education, developing my writing skills, and maybe building a new career. And also, I'm first generation in my family to go to uni, so it was very important to me to to do these things for the women who couldn't do them. Um, Kingston took me on, um, on my potential. I didn't have a job. I didn't have a publisher. And I had a very sketchy hold on on life. So they were very generous. Uh, Thank you, Kingston. Um, I became a part-time practice-based imaginative writing Southern Gothic PhD candidate, self-funded. Uh, So my first year, I was unemployed on and off, which meant I could do all the fantastic training. Uh, I got a publisher Mm -hmm. for my debut novel, Darkling Park. So for my first year at uni, I wasn't doing any PhD writing, which did make me quite anxious because this manuscript went back and forth between myself and my publisher, Patricia Belenghi, Patricia Press. Um, So, uh, and anyway, the book was published in 2016 to to great reviews. Um, And I've had to to work while doing the PhD and raise my my daughters. Um, 
And I've been a barista, I've been a bookseller, I'm a, currently a teaching assistant. So I've learned a lot of new skills and had some great experiences along the way because I've been doing a PhD and I've had to work to pay for it. Um, mm-hmm. And I wouldn't have had any of these things if I had plodded on and become, say, a say deputy head. Um, mm-hmm. And I suppose going back to what I said at the beginning, seeing the first um I think it was the first Pirates of the Caribbean film. There was something that really stuck with me. The character of bootstrap Bill Turner, who'd grown into the timbers of the ship. He was part of the Flying Dutchman, which I found really chilling. And I thought, God, don't be bootstrap Bill grown into the timbers of the of the ship. You you need to make a change. Um, And I suppose I'm I'm a mature a student I'm 50 50 I thought I was 56 yesterday and then I realized I'm 55 which was kind of nice um, <laughs> got an extra year I yes cool um so I can say a little bit more about being a mature student in just a minute if you'd like yes we're gonna we are gonna jump into that in a minute and I think that yes that is a really chilling metaphor isn't it and I think that that theme of being I loved what you said about crisis crossroads. Is it a crisis or is it just a crossroads? Well, it um, was a crisis. It was it was horrendous at, at the time, and I nearly didn't survive. But I suppose I was able to to kind of come to see that as as a crossroads. Um, but it takes you a while to get to that point to be positive about these horrendous events in your life. I think. Yes, absolutely. I kind of therapeutically, we talk about transition and it makes it sound all very nice and like you're going to be leveling up and those kinds of things. And actually, what we know is those places are full of pain and difficulty and yeah, extremity often. Um, But to see that, to see that as as a as a, a potential to move on to make changes is amazing and I really want to honor that um, in in your in your journey and that you've made that change that you've stepped out in that kind of really courageous way um and I know that that will resonate with lots of other PhD students that PhD often especially later on if people who are who are starting that later on um does mean a, a big change a big shift a lot of courage um as you step into new potential which is exciting but also a whole yeah. new landscape which can be incredibly intimidating and frightening as well well i feel that i'm being very honest about my you know my um you know, having had um, severe clinical depression and and anxiety, because Mm. I think, and that there was a terrible shame with that for, Mm. you know, it's taken me sort of 10 years to get better. But I feel if I am honest, it it gives other people a bit of hope or a bit of courage. It's okay for them to say say stuff. Um, Yeah, but the other thing I'd say is when I kind of started the PhD, there was an article, I think, in The Guardian about people going back into education um, in some parts of Africa. And some of these students were like 84 years old. And there was a guy who was 93 and they were going back and getting their uh, primary school education finished and and a kind of high school diploma. And I thought, well, if those guys can do it, so can I, you know, I'm, I'm young compared to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that, I mean, there's obviously there are bigger debates around this, but that sense of have, taking that education at a time that is right for you. Um, and for many reasons, um, things may be withheld or not yeah. available. Um, yeah. And uh, equally, I am first generation going to university and I know all that comes with that and what and the but I loved what again what you said about that in terms of being positive about in terms of claiming that experience yeah claiming that for all the women from before you who couldn't do that who had potential to I mean I only knew about uni as a kid because my grandmother worked in the the Bristol University canteen and she befriended a lot of students that came visited her when she retired so my family only really knew what a university was because she had this um you know minimum wage job at the at the campus 
I love it. So my granddad was an ambulance driver and I remember him. So he obviously went to the, to the colleges because people weren't very well. But I remember him taking me and sitting me outside the college in the car. I remember this really vividly and going, if you work really hard, Emma, you could you could go somewhere like this. And he stuck with me. So I think that, yeah, yeah. let's let's honour those people that did yeah. that work that enabled us to get where we are today. Thank you for reminding me of that because that's... Um, very special memory and um and fantastic nan too doing all that yeah. work and feeding those people yeah um so coming back to you and coming back to your the 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 moments where you're kind of coming in back into to um education and you've left behind that other life that you had and you're coming now into this uh new way of being and we wanted to talk a little bit about that then experience of being a mature student and I think also it's also that sense of 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 somebody who's is kind of starting again so having a, a mature student with a but with a, a real established career behind you that you're leaving to enter into study um and also as well as that a mature student which means that you've got a whole life around you and two daughters that you're um, needing to look after and all that that means too. So that's a very big question, if indeed it is a question at all. (laughs) Tell us a little bit about what that's like and the strategies that you have in place to to support you in that. Well, I suppose... um... I was thinking about what are the advantages and disadvantages of being a mature student. Although I have to say, when you're on a a PhD course, um, you have people of all different ages and nationalities and ethnicities. So, um, you know, you don't stand out as much as you might do uh, as an undergrad. Yes. yes. Um, So I'd say the advantages is that you're... I mean, I'm very organised. I mean, I ran a department. um, I worked in a school. um, And I have to say, when you go back to work after having a baby, you become Napoleonic in your (laughs) organisation. Otherwise, you would not survive. Not that I think I'm Napoleon, but I am Napoleonic in my organisation. Yes. Um, And after, you know, the early years of child care which I think are often very grim um and working with with inner city um teenage hecklers in Croydon <laughs> being able to study in um at home sitting at my desk here or in the our brand new university library is such a, a luxury it's such a gift like I'm almost looking around and thinking it is this my is this my life? I'm allowed to do uh, yeah. this. So in some ways, I know people have been talking about the PhD is hard, you need days off. Coming at it from where I am, it's this amazing luxury and gift to myself and my life that feels very different. Gorgeous. Um, and the thing about the COVID is really, I mean, a friend of mine said, we've got this, we've been preparing all our life for this because you know, if you if you haven't lost somebody um, um, close to you, um, for the rest of us, it, it's for me, it's background noise. Um, you know, I'm going out to work. We're going into the primary school um, and my PhD is one that I'm able to do um, here or anywhere. And, and I kind of set it up that way. My PhD had to be one where I could print off some journal articles, put them in my bag. And then when I took my mother-in-law to hospital last year, I was able to sit in the waiting room and, and read my way through journal articles. It has to be portable. Um, so um, it's been nice to be able to go out to work and have that and to be able to have the PhD um, as an escape from 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 the news Um, I suppose the disadvantages are um, and there are disadvantages in that I'm not entitled to a student overdraft for this course and I started my um, course after the time when there was Student Finance England funding available for doing PhD so I'm, I'm kind of slightly disgruntled about that but but what can you do I have to work and pay for it to go along 
Mm. Um, because I'm working, I don't do conferences. I don't have the money to go and I don't have that sort of time in that you've got to make your peace with that and, and do what you can. Um, I'm doing a PhD, but I can't do that. But there we are. Um, as I'm 55, it, I think it's quite unlikely I'm going to be getting a job in units because of the way they are with, with, with older working women. So I think I've got to be canny and maybe go for a, an FE or, or a sixth form post. Um, I've got to be realistic about what what is available um and I think because I you know I look more or less my age you do get people who just assume like a young male colleague when I worked in the bookstore assumed it was a little hobby like cro crocheting he couldn't quite understand I said no it's continued professional development um and, you know, it's, some people think you're just a, some men, middle-aged men think you're just a board house, housewife, but so that's from them. Um, and of course, doing a job, I mean, I love working with the children at the primary school, they're, they're gorgeous and it's great work. But when you're being asked to laminate and, and trim bits of paper and run errands, um, that can be hard after having had a career and it, it does, <laughs> affects your uh confidence and when you get back onto your phd you're 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 in this flow state you're in in this amazing zone um so it's i do four days at work and then three days phd right and i think it is interesting in terms of um the the kind of life place that you start the PhD at because as you say you you have an established career that you've then gone into uh, to have the luxury of the PhD there's been sacrifices in other areas um, and for people coming at it at a different point in their life they, they, there will be different sacrifices um, and it, it it is I think that's a really big thing that people perhaps need to talk about a little bit more in terms of the, the kind of cost benefit analysis, I suppose we'd call it, wouldn't we? <laughs> in terms, of, in terms yeah, of that. I think, I think, I mean, I've been talking to children about the PhD because they're having to struggle through something like maths or geography they don't want to do. And I said, it's the, the purest form of, of, or perfect form of education because you get to do exactly what you're most interested in yes, yes. so in some ways I don't think it's hard because it just becomes part of your your lifestyle I'm at work four days and then I'm here and I'm reading books about the south I'm writing and I'm thinking um, so it is it is me it is my life um, so I think if you pick pick your passion um, you might you might be doing it. I'd be writing anyway because I'm a writer. Right, right. Um, I mean, my husband's a beekeeper uh, in his spare time, and he was thinking about maybe doing a PhD in beekeeping at some future nice. point. But it's, he'd be doing the beekeeping at the weekends anyway. Um, right. So I think if you can be canny about how you do your PhD, um, it's not a, a massive burden. Mm. Mm. And we did also want to touch on this, this, um, your other responsibilities that you had. You talked about taking your mother-in-law to the hospital and I know that you have children too. So I wonder if you just talk a little bit about um, that. So we've talked about juggling work, but juggling caring responsibilities with the PhD as well. Well, I suppose I do have an advantage in that my children are older. I mean, my oldest daughter has just finished uni and my in fact, my youngest daughter is is kind of finishing uni this year. So one's 24 and one is uh, 20. Um, so it was much it's much easier to do these things when your children are older. Um, and being at university at the same time as my two daughters were really cool. Um, so I can be mum and we're having a meal or we catch up for lunch, um, you know, obviously pre-COVID. Um, so I think if you've got little children, it might be better to wait until they're a little older unless you've got very good child care. Because what's enormously stressful about having very young children, I found, was the fact that you only had a minute and a half to think. And that really did my head in. Whereas now, you know, my daughter, might, she's taught herself 
my oldest daughter has taught herself Farsi over the lockdown. So while she's doing that, I can be doing this and we've got our, you know, we can have a couple of hours where uh, she doesn't need me to, to be mum, as it were. So I think when your children are older or when they're at school, it's much it's much better. And I've had the luxury of having older children during the lockdown. I've not had to run around after after three-year-olds. Um, I just remember years ago, my husband was here working from home and he had Phoebe and Tatum and he left them with some paints and they got very quiet. Eventually came down and they'd taken off their clothes. They had painted themselves. They painted the kitchen and they painted the cat and the cat had gone all around the house with its painted paws. And I said, you can't leave them on their own like that for hours. Um, so I do, I do have the luxury of older older children who can can be left to their own devices. Um, yes. I think it would have been very hard when you just when you've got little children. It's about survival day to day. So taking on a on an extra like this, I think, would be very hard um, unless you've got the good childcare in place. It is an interesting one, isn't it? In terms of, I, I just really resonate with what you were saying about the research being a luxury. It's like that little oasis. And I know that, you know, I'm a single mum of triplets and actually to sit down with an academic book and be able to read something and have, have that moment of being in my mind is so delicious. I love yeah. it. So yeah. I think that, I think, yes, that sense of um, being a mum and doing a PhD I, I absolutely resonate with the challenges of trying to balance that out. But as you say, in terms of it's 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 life cycle too, isn't it? And the older children actually, like you say, being able to share that university experience, there's something, I guess, really lovely in that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I do know people on my P on on the PhDs at Kingston who are doing it with younger children. Um, and I suppose they're catching time, you know, if the children are at school from uh, 8.30 until 3.30 and they've got that day. Because what you need with, with PhD is to be able to read and think and allow your thoughts to, it's like smoke from a, from, um, a cottage chimney. You need your thoughts to be able to, to be free for a while before you hit upon an insight. And that, you don't get that when you're working with young children at, at home and you're interrupted, do you? You're conscious, you're constantly in your conscious mind yes. um, and you're not accessing your unconscious, I, I would imagine. Although I love what you were saying about being very, very efficient when you have children. Actually, you go, right, rather than sort of, I've, I've got three days to think about this, I've got half an hour, so yeah, I'm going to make yeah. the most of it. <laughs> and you do, and the insights do come because your mind knows that's your, your you, do. you do look, get, yeah. I look back now and go, blimey, I wasted so much time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're very, you know, when you've got time to work, you you work, don't you? Yeah. yeah. So I think that is a superpower. <laughs> well, it is. It it is. Yeah, and I I'm I'm an advocate anywhere I work because it's working parents. They're doing they're so skilled, they're doing so much. If you want a project done well, give it to them because they have these skills to get stuff done. And often when you're a working parent, you're not putting yourself forward for stuff and you're leaving work at the end of the day, not hanging around to network. And I think we need to publicise what working parents are doing and can do, particularly mm -hmm. women. Mm. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Right. That's the next campaign. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I am now going to ask... Um, an unfair question, like I asked to everybody. In terms of, out of all of that, though, all those experiences that you've had, and we're only really just touching on the surface of, of your process and, um, yeah, your journey through, but have you got any top tips or tip to, to share with us about um, working on the PhD? Oh, yes, um, I do, actually. And I have thought about this. Um, as I said to you at the beginning, um, I think before we started recording, if you don't want to sit at your desk and you put a hot water bottle under your feet, it's really <laughs> encouraging. Makes a huge difference. Um, I am definitely going to do that. A hot water bottle under your feet. What a treat is that? It's just such a treat. 
Um, I would say um, if you can spend 20 or 30 minutes each day on your own at home, somewhere where you won't be interrupted or distracted and use this time just to process your thinking. Don't ruminate, you're not meditating, but you're just processing stuff. And you often find insights come to you that day or the next day. I did this on my MA and Pete, the other students thought I was quite clever. And I said, no, I'm just doing this every day. Do this and it makes a huge difference to your, your thinking and problem solving and dealing with life. And it's a good way of picking stuff up, looking at it and then putting it down so that you, you know, you're not then having a bad night's sleep. Um, it's very powerful and it's made a huge difference to, to my life and it's a very simple thing to do. Um, I would say the other thing I do is I have I draw a pie chart at the beginning of my diary and I've got a section for PhD, one for writer career, one for work, one for family, one for friends, one for chores. There are there are about six um, headings. And then if someone comes up to me with something they want me to do or I see something I might want to do, if it doesn't fit in with one of the slices on this pie chart, I don't do it. So it makes me very, very clear all the time about what my priorities are, you know, family, PhD, work. Um, so I don't take on other things that do not fit with, with that. I mean, I do have one um, slice that's just got a question mark in because maybe something amazing will suddenly come along. But I'm very focused on what I do and what I don't do. I, I love, love that. that. Yeah, no. It's and I love the visual good. element of that yeah. too, that you can see it. Um, and the other thing I it took me a long time to learn as a new parent is take it a day at a time. And I think we often get quite stressed. It's like with the COVID and school, I just focus on what I'm doing in school with the children that day. How can we do this well? Just dealing with that day and that cuts a lot of stress and worry and chuntering mm. um, out of your mind I think if you can remember just deal with today um, so so yes four tips there <laughs> that's amazing that's amazing and yes and just focusing on the moment there is there can be real relief in that that actually all you've got to do is the thing that's in front of you that's it don't have to worry yes. about anything else just yeah. allow yourself to be in that and it can be really releasing can't it well it stops me worrying about the viva or the mock viva yes. I, I just think yes. oh let's write this paragraph on daylight gothic instead you know so <laughs> <laughs> oh Alisa I could talk so much longer to you um and thank you so much for all of that um and I know that that will resonate um with other people in terms of from the messages that I've that I've been receiving about what people are struggling with at the moment and what, what people are going through so thank you for that and thank you for the advice particularly the hot water bottle one I've particularly <laughs> enjoying that one well thank you thank you <laughs> um and don't forget um that people can sign up for the newsletter which have more information in um and as well as following us on the social media thank you so much Elisa thank you all for listening 